before the trees, right? Sometimes we get, we get so focused in on something that all we see is the tree. We need to take a moment to step back and, and, and see the forest of what's going on. See the big picture. Um, well, as, as we go through Romans, um, we, we can tend to lose sight of that forest. Um, because, I mean, it's so great. That there's so many... Uh, this Romans is so awesome. We, we, we dissect it little by little, you know, and, and hit, hit, hitting just a few verses each week. But when we're looking at one tree at a time, we can lose sight of the forest. Um, that's why, you know, before we got to Romans 8, I, I took a Sunday and I said, hey, let's step back and let's recap Romans 1 through 7 before we get to Romans 8. And then we've been, you know, looking at every tree and nook and cranny in Romans 8. It's been so good. Um, you know, he even started Romans 9 last week, just the first three verses. Um, and now we move to this section, Romans 9 through 11, which is kind of, seems a little bit weird place to kind of, uh, for this awesome chapter that Romans 8 is. I think we spent like a month and a half just on Romans 8. Uh, I mean, we all of a sudden digress into this, well, what about Israel? And that's what Romans 9 through 11 is. So how does Israel fit into this? Um, versus we would expect you know, Paul to keep on going with his exhortations on how to live and, and, and whatnot. And we'll get back to that in chapter 12. But 9 through 11 is just kind of this, whoa, okay, that's kind of a weird place to put this. And so what, what I want to do today is 9 through 11. Let's look at the forest of 9, 11, 9 through 11. Um, and, and see what's going on because there's all the months again. There's so many great passages within these chapters that we can lose sight of the fact that they're actually in the big picture of talking about Israel. Um, and so we're going to do that today. Uh, of, of we're going to do an overview of nine through eleven. It just so happens it's three chapters. That's three little points I got for you. Uh, I'm going to. We're going to look at some, uh, I'm going to give you a one sentence synopsis of each chapter. That way we have the forest before we go into the trees. Well, there's something that I actually, you know, in all the studying I do, I love studying and being able to pass it on. Uh, that's something I hadn't really thought of before. I stumbled upon it in an uh, article written of why, why three, three chapters here about the relationship to Jews and the gospel and about being chosen and whatnot. And it's, it's a historical background. It's pretty cool. I never thought of before. Because in, we know this is written to the, the church in Rome, right? And there's some interesting things about the church in Rome that makes it why this letter is very pertinent to what's going on. Because historically, we know this was written about AD 57, this letter. To work to the church in Rome. And remember, they didn't have one church. It was usually a bunch of different house churches. So this letter had been circulated among house churches in Rome. And, you know, most of them about this size, actually. Um, and so he wrote that in 1857. Well, if you back up a few years, to add some interesting historical context to what's going on here. AD 49, the Emperor Claudius expels all Jews from Rome for a myriad of reasons, and that includes Jewish Christians are expelled out of Rome in AD 49. And we know this church was founded, well, we don't know for sure, it's probably founded by Jews that were you know, in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And at Pentecost, there were thousands upon thousands of Jews that came to faith but then when it enabled Christianity to spread so fast, the fact that these Jews were from all around the known world. And so they went back to their homes, but back to their families, and they shared their faith. <laughs> they shared what, what had happened. And so that's the way you think that this church was initially, of course, the Jewish church, Jewish Christian church. Then over the time from Pentecost, which was in AD 33-ish, um, to AD 49, of course, you not have a mixed church of Gentiles who have come to faith, 
but also the Jewish Christians that are there. But then in AD 49, Emperor Claudius expels all the Jews from Rome, kicks them out. So now you had a church that used to be meshed. Now if well, you know, half or more missing, expelled from the church. And then for six years, AD 49 to AD 54, there were no Jews in Rome. So now you have a church that is only Gentile. Well, in AD 54, Emperor Claudius dies in his edict to kick all the Jews expires. And so over the next few years, Jews can start to trickle back into Rome. And that's why here in AD 57, when this letter is written, it's very pertinent because here you have a what has become a very Gentile church because all the Jews were kicked out of Rome. That is now having Jews moving back in, Jewish Christians moving back into Rome and trying to integrate back into the church. And so that's why he has to spend, it's great for him to take three chapters here on, well, what's going on with the Jews? And also, if you remember, at the, very, at the very end of chapter 8, I mean, what does he say at the very very end of chapter 8? And he says, uh, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor power nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So that begs the question, has God separated himself from Israel? Because um, now the gospel is going to the Gentiles as well. And, and that's one of the reasons he has to now take these three chapters with, uh, and address what's Israel's role in the spreading of the gospel. And that's what we have here in verses 9 through 11. It's some really good stuff. So I said, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a sentence summary of each chapter. Um, and then after we go through all three, I'm going to go back and then we're gonna say, what does this mean for us? You know, and then we, when we see the big picture uh, of what's going on here with, with Israel. Um, so, you've got your Bibles open to Romans 9. We're going to start there. Before we do, uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for what you've given us uh, to follow, to guide. And Lord, let, us, let it be a, a sword to us, cutting us and changing us. And Lord, let it be receptive, receptive for the message you have for us today. And Father, I also pray for strength in my voice today, Lord. We ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to give you the sentence, and then I'm going to kind of read through some of the key verses of that chapter. So a once in a summary of chapter 9 is not <coughs> that all Israel are saved because it's about faith, not works. Not all of Israel are saved because it's about faith, not works. Remember last week we covered verses 1 through 3 and Paul uh, is pouring out his heart how much he cares for his kinsmen. And up to the point he would willing to give up his salvation, even though we know that's not theologically possible, but it's to the point that he yearns for his, his kinsmen to know Christ. He picks it up in verse 4. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the, the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. That's a great one. But then he continues on in verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all Israel who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And here he starts going into examples. And he pulls in Abraham. Right? And we, we talk about Abraham's two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Was Ishmael included in the promise? No. It, it was Isaac just through who the promise would go. And so that's where <coughs> Jesus and there, Paul is pointing us to the fact that hey, it's not just because you're born of Abraham means you're, 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 uh, you're a physical descendant. You must be of the promise. You must be uh, you know, chosen by God. And this isn't something new he's introduced. If you go back to Romans 2, 28 and 29. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, 
nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. He is praised not for men, but from God. So this isn't a new concept. This is Paul picking that same strain up from Romans 2 to now readdressing it in Romans 9. And he's showing here, and, 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 and even in the picking of who the promise is, see, he's saying it's, it's God who's picking those who are, who are of the promise. It was God who picked Isaac. Uh, then he's going to use the example of Esau and Jacob. Um, and how Jacob what it was that, and he even uses Pharaoh as well. Um, and <laughs> and even I love, I love when he gets into you know is this fair that, that that God picks who he who he wants? And he picks it up in verse fourteen. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. <laughs> For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have. Compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. It's not up to us to choose who God's going to have mercy on. It's, it's God. He, he does it. You know? And I think, you know, that, that, this is something you know, I struggle with too. I think we struggle with it, you know? We, 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 we want to be our own person. We want to be our own God to a point. We, we want to be in control. We want to make our own decisions. We don't want to have anything above us. But, what is Paul saying? <laughs> Who are we to question God and his decisions? And that's what he points out there. Then he picks it up at the end of verse, the, the end of chapter 9. For exactly what was Israel's problem. Starting in verse 30 of chapter 9. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. Israel became so focused on carrying out the law that they lost sight of why, why they were doing it. Right? They, 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 they lost sight of who it was who told them to do it. Uh, they, 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 they just became about doing the law and not about faith. And that's the problem Israel had. So that's chapter 9. Not Israel saved, because it's only those who are, by, who are of the promise, who are of faith and not of works. Chapter 10's sentence, to be saved, well, I think I miswrote that. I'm glad my English, my aunt, who's an English teacher, isn't here. She, she, she roast me for what I wrote here. To be saved is to, let's put is to in there, wow. To be saved is to believe that Jesus is Lord and that he, to, to be saved, oh no, to be saved, comma, that should have put the comma there. To be saved, believe that Jesus is Lord and that he was raised. Sorry for my bad English, man. Whew. To be saved, believe that Jesus is Lord and that he was raised. And then I'm going to get, we should tell people about it too. To be saved, believe that Jesus is Lord. He picks it up in verse t uh, 1 of chapter 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Talking about Israel. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. They had a lot of enthusiasm. That's that zeal. They, they had enthusiasm for following the law, but they did not have the faith in Christ. And I love Paul here. Remember at the beginning of chapter 9, he expressed his, his love 
for his fellow Jews, right? His, his fellow countrymen. And here he, said, he restates that again. I, oh, I just want them to know Christ so much. So what does he do in, in his letter? Well, chapter 10 is all about the gospel. <laughs> He's going to say, I yearn for people to know Christ. And so he's going to tell them about Christ. Right here, it's picking up in verse 9. These are verses you've probably heard before. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's the gospel there, people. Pretty, pretty, pretty right there. Picking it back up. Verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He desires for them to be saved, so Paul lays it out. It's not because of what we do. It's not because we're sort of earning favor with God. It's confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing that he was raised from God the dead. That's the gospel. That's how we become saved. So we can call on the name of the Lord to be saved. That's the gospel. And that's what we need to hear day in and day out. But then he doesn't stop with just presenting the gospel. Think about, keep going on verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And then, verse 17, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. If you have the gospel, you believe the gospel, we should be telling people. <laughs> so Paul's saying here, how, how are people going to be saved unless they hear the gospel? And he's hammering on it. Faith comes from hearing, right? That's your ears. And hearing through the word of Christ, hearing God's word, hearing the promises there. Paul's challenging these readers to get up and live out their faith. It's chapter 10. Chapter 11. We've been grafted into the remnant of Israel. But all of Israel will be saved. We've been grafted in. Let, let me uh, read here. Starting in verse, or chapter 11, verse 1. I asked then, has God rejected his people? By no means. <coughs> For I myself am an Israelite. A descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. But you not, not know what the scripture do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah when he appealed to God against Israel? Jump down to verse 5. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. I think the present time for, for Paul extends to now. And there's part of Israel that has rejected Jesus, but there's also a part that is seen. Lived down by the fact that, you know, the early church was almost entirely Jews until it went to the Gentiles. They have not been rejected. And then he goes into the illustration of grafting. Uh, beginning with verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember that it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off, so that I might be grafted in. This is the, you know, if you're familiar with, you know, tree grafting, you know, you can 
you can, you know, graft in, you can put, put a branch in and, and tie it tight. I'm not sure that process, but eventually it binds into the, the trunk. I know they do it with apple trees. This is like, you can go buy an apple tree that has like one branch is one kind of apple and another branch is a different kind of apple and another uh, branch is another different kind of apple. Then they do that. It's grafting it in. And so what, what Paul's using here is we have the, 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 the tree and the olive tree, because olives are, are everywhere there, and that represents Israel. Right, the chosen church in the wild olive tree is us, the Gentiles over here. And you know, some of the when the Israel restores are rejecting God and rejecting Jesus, they were you know broken off. Well, now there's room where we can be grafted in. Remember, we're grafted in. <laughs> the trunk, the main root, is is all God. And it's all Israel. We're, we're just we're just added on there. We will never be the trunk. We, we will never be the whole olive tree. We're just a part of it. And, and this, this isn't new. I mean, this isn't like a new thing that Paul has to, to teach. This is how it was from the beginning. It's all the way back to Genesis 15 and the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, that was the first illustration Paul used in chapter 9 was, was Isaac and Ishmael. There were three aspects to the Abrahamic covenant. The, the agreement between God and Israel, or God and Abraham. And it's unconditional. Right? There, there's no, Abram has to do this in order for this to happen. No, this, this is guarantees from God that this will happen. And the three parts of the Abrahamic covenant was one, a personal blessing to Abraham. When he said, your, your seed will number as the stars. Right? He's going to have many descendants. That's the personal blessing. He'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. That's, that's the personal blessing. Then they had the national blessing through the Abrahamic covenant. Through you, you'll become a great nation. Talking about Israel. His descendants went on to become Israel. But then we have the third part, which is the universal blessing. It says, through you, all will be blessed. That's where we fit in, is the universal blessing. But the main blessings are for Israel and Abraham, and we're just grafted in there. Then he finishes up chapter 11. I love, I love these. these <laughs> you know, whenever we struggle to understand stuff that God has written in his word, we need to come to chapter 11. Let's pick it up in verse 25. I mean, we've got to remember the context of what he's been teaching about. But if you ever come upon a topic that you just are struggling to rescue your mind around, read these verses. Chapter 11, verse 25. Yes, You'd be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel, upon the fullness of the Gentiles has come. In this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, that's the promise that he'll all be saved. Then jump um, to the very end of chapter 11. These are the verses I was talking about. Verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Oh, that's a great verse to close that section off with. Okay, so what does this mean for us? These, these three chapters, in the big picture, what does it mean for us? Well, first of all, from chapter 11, Israel is still the original people of God. We, 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 the, the church has, has the, the Gentiles, the, 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 the church here today, we, we don't replace the promises of Israel. We've been grafted in. Israel's still there. And I would say that even means the country itself. Even though you know, the country as a whole of Israel has rejected um, you know, Jesus, but there are still believers there. I mean, the term is Messianic Jews. Messianic Messiah. They recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. They're Messianic Jews. Jews. And, and, and Romans tells us that they're going to be saved in the end. 
So we must not depart from the teaching that it's all about the Israel still. But now let's bring it a little closer to home here in chapter 9 and 10. So chapter 9, we, we, we have a, a people who aren't actually a child of God because all they do is follow a set of rules. They try to earn their place with God when they actually don't follow Him. Now we need to make sure we understand what it means to be right with God. It, it, it doesn't mean earning it. <laughs> it doesn't mean by doing the right things. It doesn't mean by we are saved by showing up to church on Sunday mornings. We're saved by faith. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, if you believe that He is Lord, you believe that He was raised, that is how we're saved. Nothing added on to that. Because that's the nuts and bolts of it. You guys know the uh, very popular Left Behind series books, Get to the End Times? You know, and, and it's uh, you're the, the left behind, those who considered themselves saved, but when the rapture happened, they went, oh, oh I'm still here, right? And, and, and so it's about these people that you know, knew the gospel, that they had been had the gospel shared with them, but they didn't truly believe, you know? And, and, you know, they, and, and they ran from, you know, a husband of, of, of a, you know, a wife who was, who, was, who was gone and the husband was left behind. They even got into church officers. I think a church deacon. I'm not saying you can start deacons, by the way. No. <laughs> no. Uh, the church deacon was left behind because all they did was go through the motions. He didn't truly believe. By the way, I, I truly believe every one of our deacons is saved. I'm still going to challenge them to keep growing. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it just, it, when trials come, and it talks about you know, in the end times, when persecution comes, you know, that's why Christianity is growing overseas, because there's no fluff. <laughs> it's, do you love Jesus? Okay, you might die for it. <laughs> Here we, we can come to church and be comfortable and, 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 and just be able to fit in and not truly believe. But we need to. We need to have be checked on, on that. Don't deceive ourselves. Are we here just to feel good about ourselves? To just get ourselves a lift for the week? If you are, if that's not why God has you here. God has so much more for you. He wants so much more for you. Go back and read, read chapter 8 again. Church is not a self-help. Okay, this is, we come together to worship the Lord and to help each other through life. So that's chapter 9 of, 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 of what's going on. And in chapter 10 we see this beautiful explanation of the gospel. <laughs> Beautiful explanation of the gospel. Yes, he desires his people to be saved. And he challenges people to tell other people about it. Right? And, and we go back to him, that's the similar chapter, the beginning of chapter 9. And, and we, he uses that word preach. I don't like that word in the ESV. I, I like uh, the uh, how we'll. Uh, let me get to the chapter here. And how will they hear without someone preaching? I think the New Living has a, has a better. How will they hear without someone telling them? Don't think just because the word says preach that it's, that's what I do. <laughs> no, that's just telling people. That's someone proclaiming the gospel to them. Telling them exactly what Paul has said here in chapter 10. Are we telling people about Jesus? You know, in today's age, it's really easy to tell ourselves, I, I, I'm living out the gospel, right? That my, how I live my life is an example of, 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 of how Jesus worked me. They'll see Jesus in how I act. Sounds great, but is that biblical? They're going to see Jesus in how we act? What is chapter 10, verse 17? For faith comes from hearing. Right? Faith doesn't come by seeing somebody. It comes, faith comes by hearing. 
Do people hear our actions? No. We must tell people. There was a, st a study done a few years ago about evangelism. There's been a lot of different studies. I like this one. One of them, they asked Christians this question, and only 64% believe they have a responsibility to share the gospel. Down from 89% in 1993. It's pretty shocking. Another study done asking Christians came with these very sobering statistics. 55% have never shared the gospel. 24% have shared the gospel one to two times. Only less than half have even invited someone to church. So think about it. We got right about 20 people in the day. So 11 of you if this stats, 11 of you perhaps never shared the gospel with somebody. Nine of you haven't even invited someone to come to church. How in the world can we say we love Jesus, that we are thankful for what he has done in our lives and not want to pass it on to others? You know, in, in thinking that if we just live good lives that, that, that reflect Jesus, that, that people will see that and, and, and they'll, because of how we live our lives, they will want to have Jesus. See, if you boil that down, and, and I'll, I'll admit, I have told myself that for years. But if you boil that down to what we're truly meaning and what we're saying, all we're doing is trying to justify our lives by our works. If we live good enough lives, then people will see Jesus. That's just works-based living. That's not faith. And that's just what Israel was doing. So instead of, of, of fooling ourselves into thinking that performance-based evangelism, you know, if, if, if I'm good enough in living out my life, people will see Jesus. Now, that's not the gospel. That's not what the Bible says. But yet, what are we hearing? We need to open our mouths and tell people about Jesus. Instead of trying to be the, the perfect co-worker, the, the perfect neighbor, the, the perfect family member, we should tell them, hey, sorry for that little mishap last week. I, I, I know I screwed things up. I'm, I, I'm not perfect. But, you know, I, I was wondering if I could share with you about someone who was perfect enough that I could be right with God. Open that door. Or you see someone who's overwhelmed and be like, you know, I couldn't help that you seem over and overwhelmed. It seems life is throwing a lot at you right now. Can, can I share something with you that really helped when I got through time? You tell them about Jesus. Anything else? Just talk about Jesus. Talk about the church. Which do you think God cares about more? Living a good life or being real with God and being real with the people around us? Be real with the people around us for what Jesus has done for you. Did you come to the gospel because someone is living a good life? You came to the gospel because someone knocked upside the head with the Bible, probably, metaphorically speaking. You needed to hear the words, not just see something. Let's not fall into what Israel did, trying to earn God's favor, but instead let's be real to ourselves, to the people around us, and most importantly, let's be real to God. Let's tell the people we care about, the people that we interact with, about the hope that we have. You know, I think about it, I mean, we... We like to complain about our country. We like to complain about where it's headed. You know, some scholars even call us a post-Christian. You know, 
nation. It's on the decline. Let me tell you, our nation, just as Paul had such a, a, a burden for his fellow countrymen, the Jews, our nation isn't going, to be, isn't going to change based on who's president. It's not going to change based on the Supreme Court. It's not going to change on who's in Congress. Our, our state isn't going to change based on who's governor. If we truly care about our country, if we care about our state, if we care about NorCal, if we care about French Gulch, if we care about the trailer park, if we care about those on Main Street, if we care about the schools, if we care about people up East Fork, if we care about each other here in church, we will tell them about Jesus. Not just living a life that shows the gospel, but opening our mouths and proclaiming Jesus is Lord. Talking about spiritual things. And if you struggle with doing that, I encourage you to start it here at church. Think about your conversations here. Do you talk about spiritual things? Do you talk about what God has done in your life here at church? If you can't do it with one another, you're going to really struggle telling unbelievers. So let's start it here. Tell one another what God is doing in your life through Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for what you have for us in your most holy word. It's so good. Father, I pray you be motivated us. Lord. Paul, he just lays it out there. We need to open our mouths and proclaim Jesus. And what a great time. Why does it come up on Christmas time, Lord? And Everything shows that people are more open to hearing about Jesus around these holiday times. Father, I pray to take advantage and share about Jesus to those around us. If we want any change around this, it starts telling people about Jesus. So Father, thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for your, your faithfulness to your people, Israel. You, you have not forsaken. You've not given up on them, Lord. <laughs> And that's a hope for us. But even though many of Israel rejected you, Lord, you did not reject them. They will be saved in the end, Lord. So we thank you that no matter how many times we struggle, we said against you, Lord, you are faithful. You, you did not reject us. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.